Welcome back to Rubrics, a St. Timothy's podcast. I am Father Luke Klingstead, and with me is not Father Steve. We have Dr. <laughs> Robert Matthews here, and we're going to be interviewing him. He is our organist and choir master here at St. Timothy's, has a wealth of expertise and knowledge um, regarding music and sacred music, and um, I think for most people, they hear the music, they know it's beautiful, but to understand what goes into that and to learn a little bit about you, sure. I think it'll be a really exciting conversation. So we are Sounds definitely good. looking forward to that. So we're going to waste no time. I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we're going to dive right in. Let us pray. O Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know thy Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leadeth to eternal life, through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Robert, they've heard Father Steve and I tell our stories and you know how we, how we grew up and our journey to our profession many times. So I think it'd be only right to ask you to kind of talk about you know, when did you start getting involved with music, um, kind of your past experience, and what has now brought you to St. Timothy's, um, where you're kind of heading up all of it? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I grew up in North Carolina in Carthage, which is um, just south of Raleigh, and uh, started pay- playing piano when I was 11. Um, fortunate to have some good teachers early on that um, really took me under their wing particularly my high school piano teacher was um, amazing, McKellar Israel. Um, think about him probably on a weekly basis, actually. Um, That's good. And uh, so then I, I just decided to go ahead to uh, major in music and piano um, in undergrad and ended up teaching high school choir for seven years after that. Um, went back and got my master's while I was teaching high school and then um, decided I wanted to get my doctorate and try teaching college and so went to UNCG and then taught at Emory and Henry and um, then for me really the piano has always kind of been the elephant in the room so Mm -hmm. I decided um, I wanted to scratch that itch and went back to school to study piano at Salem College and that's what brought me to Winston-Salem and uh, there's a funny story um, a lot of people may have heard it. Like I was here in Winston Salem, looking for a place to live when I was about to come to school at Salem, and um, I couldn't find any place that that really fit what I was looking for. So I decided one last drive through the Ardmore neighborhood, mm-hmm. and um, I knew that St. Timothy's was looking for an organist at that time. So I thought, well, I'll just drive by the church and look in the window. Yeah, and. Um, Father Steve and Lee Tolberry happened to be in the church, and so I got to meet them. They were cleaning up after a funeral, I think, and um, I told Father Steve, you know, I'm, I'm not really an organist. I'm a, a pianist, but um, I thought about applying for this job, and so he encouraged me to do so, and I did, and uh, they ended up hiring Raymond Hawkins as the mm-hmm. organist, but... Um, Kristen figured out a way to to make it work for me to come on as um, an uh, assistant for her, and it was a part time position while I was in school, and um, I've stuck around for nine years. Yes, and uh, you know things turned out that I was able to um, study organ with Tim Olson while mm-hmm. I was studying piano, and. Um, I was fortunate to have this organ to practice on, and I live across the street, so that was really helpful. And I did a lot of um, substituting along the way when Raymond or Mark um, had to be away. And and then ultimately, when the position became available, I I was filling in as interim organist. And one day I just asked Father Steve, can I just go ahead and do this job? And um, so he made that work. And um, so it's been a journey that I didn't really plan, but it's yeah. been, been a really great a great journey. And um, so, yeah, that's how I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, Robert has uh, kind of tentatively or, or humbly said, you know, I, I would practice the organ. And if you have ever prayed at St. Timothy's or been up here, you've probably heard the organ being practiced. Robert is... 
um, notorious for making sure it is done well and, and done um, perfectly in, in, you know, most cases. Um, and so you really have kind of taken that, that organ um, and learned how to do it exceptionally well. And, um, you know, anybody at a service here has, has reaped the benefits of that. So yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll call that Providence, that long winding road that you <laughs> happen to be here. Um, right. as, as Father Steve and Lee were here, um, and it has been wonderful. And, you know, your kind of winding road was even before I got here. And so by the time I showed up, you know, I've just known you as the organist. Um, sure. yeah. And I remember when, you know, you told me why well, I just started playing the organ, you know, not too long ago in the grand scheme of things. I was a pianist first, and um, that was interesting for me. But that's kind of your, your background story. And then what was it like, um, or how did you get an entrance into sacred music, okay. um, into mass settings, and kind of the specific context of what we do here, not just playing the organ, playing the piano, but learning about mass settings and sacred music, um, you know, the Anglican tradition of music. What was right. that kind of like? Um, well, I've always grew, I've always grown up um, in church music. Yeah. Um, I grew up going to um, a Methodist church okay. and also um, with my dad. And then my mom was, is a Quaker. So mm -hmm. I went to that tradition as well. Um, but so I started playing piano around age 11 and pretty soon the, the small Methodist church that I grew up in needed a pianist. And so I sort of cut my teeth there. Um, a friend of mine around the same age and I um, shared the duties. Mm -hmm. And uh, we played all the hymns that, all the easy hymns yep. in the congregation. They were very gracious to let us um, play them over and over. And um, so I that was a great start for me. Um, and then later on in high school, I started um, playing at a, a different church, and uh, even my high school um, piano teacher, he was the organist at a Baptist church okay. in Carthage, and he had me substitute for him, and at that, that time, I was, you know, playing manuals only, but it was a good introduction to um, liturgical music, mm -hmm. um, and through my journey, I've, I've had several different church positions. Yeah. I worked at um, Henshaw Street Baptist Church when I was teaching high school. Okay. Um, I, I was interim pianist at um, Abingdon United Methodist when I was teaching at Emory and Henry. And um, also, when I was in grad school at UNCG, I was a choral scholar at uh, West Market Street United okay. Methodist. So, But I'd never been at an Episcopal church Um you know, other than attending here and there for, you know, various yeah. events, but never, never working. Um, but f fortunately, my, my training in choral music, I had already done a lot of um, mass settings, of course. It's, it's hard to avoid, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, requiems, all that sort of thing we, we had done in, in concert settings. Yeah. And so actually, when I came here, I had a lot to learn about the um you know the just the the order of the mass and mm -hmm. the music that was appropriate for that fortunately for me Kristen was here That's right. and had done a lot of work um in figuring all that out already yeah. and so the sort of the the a lot of the the research aspect to that um she had already she had the ball rolling on and so I really benefited from that um and so yeah I just sort of learned on the job essentially because when I first came here I was mostly singing in the choir and then helping Kristen as as needed mm -hmm. um, so sort of just learned by doing yep. and um, having been here for nine years you know the the liturgical cycle repeats and um, you just get more and more comfortable with it right um, and you you figure out also um, what works for, for this parish and for the resources that we have, the instruments we have, the singers we have. And um, so I think, I think we've, we've done a lot of things this year that, that I, I'm really um, proud of. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a joy. Like for me, Schubert is one of my favorite composers. Yep. So being able to sing a Schubert mass setting at Easter yep. um, was a real highlight for me this past year. 
So yeah, that's basically been my path. Yeah. Um, uh, one one thing that I've I've really had to dig into is um, chanting. Um, yeah. That because that's something I had run into um, in choral music previously, but but certainly not to this extent. Yeah. And Anglican chant is something that I had never done before coming here, singing the Psalms, and uh, so that's been. It's been a great supplement to my education, mm -hmm. um, and I think also to my, my spiritual life. Um, it's sort of amazing, I think, when you sing something, how much easier it is to uh, remember it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you can prove that from things you remember from elementary yeah, school, right? Yeah, as a right? kid, so. you remember what <laughs> songs you were taught by your parents in little commercial jingles. Absolutely. I mean, those are the two people always point to. They, yeah. they stick in your head. Right, so it's the same thing with singing the psalms. Mm -hmm. um, that you just, I'll find myself uh, singing them throughout the week, yep. uh, just because I've been practicing them, or um, even a line from an introit, mm -hmm. or um, things that 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 repeat throughout the the church year. Um, they they really stick with you, and they they come back around, and they feel like an old friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you you kind of started to to get at this. We have done. And you have done all sorts of kind of just a whole breadth of stuff. I mean, from Advent lessons and carols that we've done a couple different variations of to the St. Cecilia Mass to Schubert Mass to Evensong. I'd be curious to know what is, and, and maybe, you know, um, you kind of alluded to it, what's something that you've been most proud of? And then what has been maybe the most challenging thing that you've done um, at St. Timothy's in, in your time here? Um, there may be a lot to pick from, but sure, I'd be curious yeah. to get some of your initial thoughts on that. I was, this year, I think um, you mentioned the St. Cecilia Mass, so that was definitely a, a big highlight. Kristen was leaving we decided we wanted to honor her mm -hmm. and so we just decided well let's take a shot in the dark and see if we could commission a mass setting mm -hmm. and the very first name that came to mind was Sarah McDonald because Kristen had done some of her music with the choristers and um, I thought Sarah McDonald was a, a really top-notch composer yeah but maybe someone that is more near the beginning of her composing career, mm -hmm. maybe someone that we could actually afford yeah. to commission. Yep. Um, and f fortunately, she said yes immediately, so yeah. we didn't really have to search very hard. Um, and then it was pretty easy to recruit singers um, and musicians to come sing in honor of Kristen, and um, so we ended up having a really fine choir um, mm -hmm. and my organ teacher Tim Olson came to play um, and also somehow the timeline worked out really well where we had plenty of um, rehearsal time yeah. to learn the mass and to feel really secure um, and there were a lot, lot of serendipitous moments uh, St. Cecilia Day is the patron saint of music perfect for Kristen but it also happened to be um, Sarah McDonald's birthday. birthday yeah. yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Which was great. And um, also it, it ended up, the feast day was just before Thanksgiving. So somehow it felt even more appropriate yep. um, in, that, in that season. So. There's all sorts of stuff that came together. But that, yeah. I think that was a highlight for a great number of people. I mean, that was a tremendous display of of our talent and also a way to honor Kristen and everything that she did and kind of set a lot of the stones in place and then to see it come to fruition like that was quite remarkable. And we found out the mass setting is going to be published. It is. So yep. now other churches can do that. And um, of course, we'll come back and revisit yep. the mass setting. Yep. It's a little more involved. It's not something that we could do um, just on a regular Sunday morning because yeah. um, it really... In requires an organist and a conductor yep. at least for 
um, a couple of the movements. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, we're going to definitely bring it back and, and use it for, for another feast day. We'll what's, see when. So. What's been one of the most challenging things? Uh, I The first thing that came to mind when you said that was um, the the setting of the, the Gregorian Mass, okay. uh, the uh, um, Requiem Mass. Um, the first time that we put that together and we we used the setting from the Libra's Wallace, so it was all plain chant. Yeah. And um, it's just a lot of music. Yeah. And to do that without the aid of the organ um, and just the amount of text that you have to deliver, um, even in just the DS era, mm -hmm. is a little daunting. Um, and I had never done that before. So that the first time that we did that, I remember... Um, feeling like I was drinking water from a fire hose. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of music to put together in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we've done um, the All Souls Requiem, I guess I've done it nine times now here. Yeah. Um, it's It feels more manageable, certainly. Um, every year it does come around, and I'm, I'm always uh, reminded, wow, this is really a lot of chanting. <laughs> um but I, I think because the acoustic at St. Timothy's is really perfect for mm -hmm. chant, um, I always really, I think that, that's a really special uh, mass for me. Um, just, it, it's different from what we do on a regular basis. Um, we don't ordinarily do quite that much chant yeah. in, in one mass. And um, it, I think the choir also really enjoys the change of pace there. So it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and now it's coming back to it each year. It does feel a little more familiar and a little more manageable. You mentioned um, kind of doing the Requiem. Um, and we've alluded to, you know, the acoustics in our space and how our church is set up. I'm going to put up a picture of our organ up on the screen right now. So if you're watching, you'll, you'll see it come on the screen. But our organ has um, kind of an interesting history, and, you know, it's in the back, and so there's a lot of people who feel like they've never actually seen it um, up close, or they kind of glance the top of it, depending on where they sit. But, but you know, I'll give people who are watching a chance to look at it. Why don't you talk a little bit about this particular organ? Um, and honestly, I think people would be curious to know, maintenance of this um, is very involved. Maintaining right. a, an organ like this Talk a bit about, you know, what's necessary to make sure this is functional each and every week sure. and maybe some of its history. Yeah. Um, well, it's a Hook and Hastings built in 1898 in Massachusetts and was going to be demolished when a church was, was being taken down. And uh, John Farmer, we're fortunate to have him in this community. Mm -hmm. um, saw that it was available and uh, went and took it apart piece by piece with a lot of help from volunteers and um, came and reassembled it here at St. Timothy's. Um, of course, he had to do um, some adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, that he, he has um, had to replace some wood and um, some, some different parts to modernize it a bit so that um, we have... Um, pistons and, and memory levels that we're able to use, mm -hmm. which makes life so much easier. Um, but yeah, it does have a very beautiful sound. I think it's a, a great size organ for the space that we mm -hmm. have. And um, it does take quite a bit of maintenance. Um, we're fortunate that, that John Farmer is, again, in this community. And so he, he maintains the organ. And um, I have him on speed dial, so yep. in fact, I just had to text him yesterday because we had a, a pedal that was sticking. Um, so usually I can text him and he'll respond um, sometimes within the day mm -hmm. and just swing by and, and make adjustments. Um, there are seasonal considerations with tuning that we have to take care of. Um, one sort of quirk that is a little more difficult is um, in the summer we deal with the humidity mm -hmm. and um, so some of the swell division becomes unusable in the summer um, but it's it's always been like that so um, I know how to deal with that we do have a plan for trying to overcome that but we have several 
small organ projects that are in the queue right. <laughs> that, uh, that we're working on. So, um, but no, no big emergencies. Um, so we're just taking it one by one and, and trying to, um, make improvements and, and keep the organ, um, you know, maintained and, um, and then, you know, add a stop every now and then when we have a, a, a donor that wants to, you know, improve the organ. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it, it's a long process. It but, is. Um, it, it works really well for, for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis here at St. Timothy's. Uh, it's been a, a great instrument for me to learn on. Um, it's a tracker instrument, um, which means that that you have a lot more expressive control over the the pipe speech based on how you um, you raise and lower the keys, okay. um, which is is nice. Um, you know, every church doesn't have a tracker instrument, and um, so it's I feel very fortunate that that we have that here, and um, it is. A little bit non-traditional, like the the pedal board is is not um, an AGO pedal board, and so uh, learning for me on this instrument, it's a, it's a very um, specific instrument um, for this space, and uh, like normally an AGO pedal board will be a radiating pedal board, and this one, all the pedals um, are parallel, okay. perfectly parallel, okay. um, but. I've been playing on it long enough. This actually feels normal to me. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I think that gets at something that I remember you talking about a long time ago, that the, the organ has always kind of been this unique center of musical attention um, to the point where, and I'm sure you'll correct me, that the organ used to kind of determine the, the you know, setting for what a particular note was in some instances, right? right? In yeah, some, some towns. I um I'm not an expert on this history at all, but it there. Before uh, tuning was was firmly established yeah. across the musical world, um, often like now we say A is 440, and that's mm -hmm. what a lot of orchestras tune to, or or something near mm -hmm. that. Um, but before that was established across the world. Um, towns would tune to whatever a the organ the main yeah. organ in town was um, and it it wasn't consistent um, so actually our organ here is right now it's around a 432 um, which it's a little bit lower than 440 which can be a little frustrating when we have guest instrumentalists that have to come and, and tune, tune, and, tune yeah. down just a bit um, but we've we've Managed to deal with that, no problem. Um, we do have a, a guest violinist that comes, mm -hmm. um, Charlie Schaefer, and Charlie actually ends up bringing two violins, <laughs> one to play with the piano and one to play with the organ. Oh, okay, I did not know that. <laughs> Interesting. Because um, retuning mid-service is a little a bit big disruptive. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we just have two different violins. Actually... The, the second violin, one of our, our choir members, Marissa McNatt, um, loans us so that we can have two different violins. Yeah. Um, so that's how that magic happens. And since we're in the back of the church, no one really notices right. that he's switching violins. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, and it's it's more difficult for for different instruments. Um, I, I found that a, a brass player has a little bit of an easier time okay. um, lowering to match the organ. And for a string player, it's a little more involved. So they have to tune four strings <laughs> okay, um, rather than just one instrument. So um, That's true. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a wonderful theological point there of, you know, the church's music and the church kind of setting the standard for all sorts of the rest of the town. I mm. mean, the, the town yeah. would look toward the church to kind of, define something for them, um, theologically, also musically. And, right. you know, the organist would be the musical standard for, for the rest of the town. I think right. there's something um, wonderful there. Um, not like that anymore. Now you've got, you know, apps on your phone that can yes, right. tell you if something's <laughs> in or out of tune. Um, but you've got, you've got some props here. Um, I don't know if this is related to this question, but um, 
you can you know incorporate them as you want, but people show up on Sunday morning um, or you know on a weeknight mass. We've got Ascension coming up, and they hear the music, they hear the finished product. Um, you don't show up on Sunday morning and work four hours a week. Um, right. You are here night and day all week making all sorts of decisions and practicing and preparations. Take us through a normal week. Um, what, where does it start? What decisions do you have to make? You know, how often are you practicing? What are you practicing? And especially, you know, maybe it changes seasonally. Um, but kind of take us through a normal, as normal as it gets a week, and what goes into working towards Sunday? Sure. Um, yeah, I brought a few things here. Um, so Father Steve and I have a, a Google spreadsheet yeah. that we work on. And um, I fill in the, the musical components. And then he is able to um, populate the bulletin through this information. Yep. And, um, of course... You know, we're using the lectionary, and yeah. so we're planning music according to the lectionary, and um, we have some great resources. Okay. Um, for example, we're in year A right now, so this is the book that I've been using. There we go, <laughs> liturgical music for exactly. the Revised Common Lectionary Year A. Yeah, so I can just look up for Sunday, um, Easter 6, and um, it gives us all kinds of suggestions here based on the readings of hymns that that fit each of the readings and even choral anthems or solos okay. that match the readings as well um this is a jumping off place yeah um where where is it taking those suggestions from is it only from our hymnal it is yes okay. well there there are a few hymnals but they're all related to the episcopal church gotcha so um but the the hymnal that we have in the pew is is the, the standard 1982, 1982. Yep. Right. um and so i'll look through these suggestions usually as a starting place and um if if they don't fit exactly what i'm looking for necessarily um another resource that i use is so in the pews we have a hymnal mm -hmm. and this is another resource called a hymn book mm -hmm. which, and if you open a hymn book expecting a hymnal <laughs> you're going to be wildly confused right right so so i like this because it has the organ part in there um, it's not, it does not have any of the service music. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the, in the back, there is a, like a, a concordance and literally just starting from Genesis going all the way to Revelation, um, with all of the, the verses broken down. Okay. So, you know, so if by scripture reference, yeah, if I, if the scripture is from John one, then I have a whole column here of suggestions that would fit the various verses. Okay. Um, and so then I'll often thumb through those and, um, and see if there's anything that, that I think it may be a better fit. Yeah. Um, another resource that I use is um, this, these minor propers mm -hmm. that we, we sing every Sunday um, because often there's something that's mentioned in the introit or the alleluia and the minor verse. propers are right. introit, alleluia verse, the things that offertory change, verse. offertory verse. Um, so if you, you know, at 11 o'clock we do an introit, um, you might not hear that if you've never come to, to nine. Right. Um, but it's it's been in the church's tradition for a long time. If you come to daily mass, Father Steve and I simply speak it. Right. Um, at 11, you know, we'll have a soloist sing it. Um, so that is, you know... That's what he means by minor propers. Right, um, yeah. And, and often the text for the minor propers will inspire an anthem choice for okay. that Sunday or, or a, another hymn choice that I, I did not notice just looking at the, the readings for the day. Okay. Um, and to, that's why I brought this in um, for this Sunday. In fact, um, the intro is with a voice of singing, declare ye this. And there, there are several anthems that actually fit that exact text. And so okay. we, we could have sung that as our anthem yeah. for this Sunday. I ended up choosing um, the Talus, If Ye Love Me, because that is the gospel reading for this yep. Sunday. And also we're, um, we're in our post-Easter season, and so the choir has spent a lot of time working on um, music to prepare for Easter and, and other... Um, masses 
so after Easter, it's, it's nice for, to let them sing something that is, is familiar and a little yeah. easier to put together. So they've sung the talus many times. Yeah. So pause right there and, and point out something that you, you mentioned, but to make it explicit, you are using resources, but there's 10 or 15 suggestions there. You're still having to go through all of those and make decisions. So this is not, Robert, here's what we're playing um, from Correct. the, from the right. book of the Episcopal Church. I mean, as the organist and choir man, you are having to make all sorts of decisions um, about that, and a lot of intentional planning goes into that. I mean, you were mentioning Certainly. we're going to sing Talus If You Love Me because that is, is in the gospel. You look at the minor propers. You're not just saying, we like this hymn, we like this anthem, let's, let's do this one this week, let's do this one next week. There's some Certainly. formation actually happening there that you are participating in the formation of the service and in, in trying to incorporate the readings and the music and the proper so that it all kind of creates a cohesive you know, point being made. Certainly. Um, yeah. That is something that people might implicitly pick up on, but maybe they've never thought about how much decision and thought has to go into that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and additionally, like sometimes there are... Um, other th- other sources of inspiration, for instance, this Sunday is Mother's Day. Right. And um, so for our final hymn, we're going to sing, Sing We of the Blessed Mother. Yeah. Um, which would, would not have been suggested in this resource here. Right, right. Um, but with Mother's Day in mind, and also we've been singing the Regina Celli at the end of the 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it would be really appropriate. And this this is a hymn we, we sing a lot here, and... People love it. There is so many people's favorite hymn. <laughs> yeah, I I wanted to include that. Um, and uh, an interesting thing happened this week. Actually, it was not intentional, but um, so we have four hymns, and three of the four hymns are in F major, <laughs> somehow. Interesting. Um, so there there are some just musical components to the planning as well. Mm-hmm. So like um, I like to to make sure that there is a cohesiveness liturgically but also musically um for instance um, this sunday i was thinking about mother's day we just had the piano tuned and i thought i'm going to play the wc reverie as the prelude um and then which also happens to be in f major <laughs> mm-hmm. um and then so okay the the prelude is french well let's make the postlude french as well so i picked a vierne a vierne um prelude to, to play as the postlude. And um, so those, those sorts of things I, I do try to have. Last week, um, because of the coronation, we had all English music. Yep. Um, so those are considerations little, as little well. Little things that people might not immediately pick up on. Um, I'm sure some people are saying, I walk in and it's the first thing I'm doing is figuring out you know what decisions Robert's made. I'm sure we have those people, but some people may have never thought about that. I do try... Um, there are often times where we need a little improvisation during the service for moving music yep. after the gospel, and um, I'm I'm al- always thinking, you know, how might this music be used to um, devotionally? And um, like this past Sunday, I'm the way and the truth and the mm-hmm. life was the gospel. So um, Chris Irvin sang the call mm-hmm. by Vaughn Williams, "Come my way, my truth, my life." Um, and just to preview that, I, I use that in the improvisation um, to put that tune in someone's ear, maybe even um, unconsciously. Mm-hmm. They, like, like when walk, he starts singing, they think, oh, yeah, that's some, somehow yeah, familiar. That, that was in my head already. Uh, like when you walk out of a, the grocery store and you're, you're singing a pop tune, yep. and you're like, how did I get that in my head? <laughs> that's good. Um, and this may make people appreciate Robert even more. You mentioned the improvisation. You will plan it to the point where you will know, depending on now, who is celebrating, who is preaching. It might take us 30-second difference to get to the pulpit if one of us is sitting in the sedalia (laughs) versus chanting the gospel right there. Nobody, I guarantee you, has ever thought about Robert's having to consider which one of them is preaching and how long (laughs) it's going to take. And that is in your mind in addition to the rest of the service. Um, it is mo- mostly because my back is to the altar yep. when I'm, I'm playing, so um, it's best for me not to be surprised in the moment. Yes. Um, and that, that mostly 
comes from, you know, I still feel like I'm relatively new to the organ. So the fewer surprises for me, the better. Um, so I say improvisation, but I'm, I'm but it's not, you're not improv. I'm definitely a planner. Yes. You know, I, I have this, these improvisations planned out to a point, um, where, you know, there, there's some wiggle room in a lot of places, but but I, Your plan, though. I know what I'm doing. You're so. prepared. Yeah. <laughs> Ahead of I mean, time. It takes us a, you know, it takes me 30 seconds more to put on the veil or it slips off and I'm, you know, messing with the veil and right after communion, you're, you've got something planned, ready to go I, I, um, I do, to fill in that, that space. I, I do um, try to, to be ready for the unexpected, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Little things that I'm sure people appreciate that they have never thought of. So, you mentioned that you know you, you you've already got your decisions for Sunday. It's Wednesday morning. What what day do you want to make those decisions by? Well, you know, as early as possible. Really, it, it's nice if we can plan ahead, like several weeks. Um, sometimes it's it's difficult to do that just sheerly because of the number of um, of masses that we have. You know, some sometimes. Um, we're we're working a, a week at a time, mm-hmm. um, and also with the choir. Sometimes I'm not quite sure exactly um, the personnel that we'll have um, very far in advance. So sometimes it's it's really it's nice to be flexible and to be able to um, to put something together in a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so certainly on Monday morning, I have everything. My the, the first. Um, order of business for me is to make sure I know exactly what I'm doing on Sunday, the following Sunday, and then I have the whole week to, to make sure to mm-hmm. make that happen. Um, we've planned out anthems well ahead of that, and so the choir has been practicing several anthems, you know, weeks in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, but but some of the other details, like the, the choice of hymn or, or prelude, postlude, that sort of thing, I can, I can do... Um, with with a little less notice, um, so but yeah, so like um, we could put together a service certainly in a week. So what I would do is I would choose the music and populate the the Google spreadsheet, um, and then Father Steve would put it into the bulletins. And um, usually, what I'll do is I'll I'll look and I'll find out okay, what are the most difficult things I have to to practice on organ Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll go ahead and start practicing those immediately. And, um, if it's, if it's a really busy week, um, the nice thing is I can, I can choose things I know that will take a little less practice time. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it's, if it's not that busy of a week and I wanted to try something that, that is new to me or new to the choir, um, then that will be a good opportunity to do that. So sort of flexible based on how busy we are at mm-hmm. the time. Um, and then Wednesday is when the choir practices. Mm-hmm. So usually Wednesday is sort of reserved for um, me mentally preparing for choir. So I, I like to make a sort of like a lesson plan mm-hmm. probably based on my years teaching. Yep. Um, so, and, and we just, we, We'll practice at, at six o'clock from six to eight, and we um, usually are just working a week at a time. And so, looking ahead, we've been practicing for Pentecost now for a few weeks um, because that's going to be the sort of the end of the choir season. The choir is, is working to to put together a Mozart, Veni, Sancte Spiritus, um, and we're going to have violin, double bass, trumpet, timpani, organ for that so that'll be sort of like um the choir's um send off for the summer yeah of course they'll be singing throughout the summer but they take a little break from wednesday rehearsals um, but they'll they come on sunday mornings a little mm-hmm. bit early and um so there are lots of anthems that we have in our back pocket that we can yeah. sing in the summer um based on who we have on any given sunday so you, you bring up the choir um something that St. Timothy's Father Steve and, you know, Kristen made and decided a long time ago was to have paid singers. Right. Um, yeah. That's a conscious decision that, that not every church does. Not every church has the luxury of doing. Um, right. Some churches are, you know, hamstring by budget, but that is something that we make sure is in our budget. Talk a little bit about the benefit of that. Why, why is it worth 
paying people to sing. Um, I think some people that's that's kind of foreign to them. But if you place it in any other, you know, context of a business or a um, singing group, of course you want to pay people. They are putting in the work. You want them to um, be able to put in enough work, and, and you know you do that by making it into a a professional thing. But talk a little bit about some of the benefits of that. Why do we why do we pay people to do that, um, and what benefit does that give you? You know, mm-hmm. as opposed to maybe a, a all volunteer choir where you're kind of hoping that some people show up. Right. Yeah. I, lots of things come to mind. Um, so I taught high school and college for many years, mm-hmm. and we would have the benefit of having an entire semester to put a concert together. Yeah. Um, but in church music, essentially you're doing a concert once a week, mm-hmm. and uh, we have to learn a lot of music very, very quickly. And um, so really the benefit is um, these section leaders, they, they've all studied music and they all read music very, very well. And so we can put music together pretty quickly with their help. And so they, they are essentially there to give a little bit of support to the volunteers. And um, the other real benefit for me is now that, that I am um, both directing the choir and organist, um, the choir doesn't have a conductor right. other than me nodding my head. Or and uh, you course. may have seen some <laughs> wild pictures of, of Robert, you know, two-handing it, one hand on the organ, one hand conducting. Right, right. But I have some more help. Well, the choral scholars yeah. are, are they're very knowledgeable, and, of course, we're practicing this ahead of time. Um, but, but, but they know what I'm looking for musically, and they, they help um, make sure that yeah. that takes place. And we're and blessed to have a school of the arts nearby where absolutely, we draw a lot yeah. of people from. Yeah, and, and the, these, they're very committed. Um, they, they give a lot of their time, the staff singers. So, so we have five of them, Emily Ford Coates, Carla Bowers, Sarah Taylor, David Mays, and Chris Irvin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so two sopranos, a mezzo, a tenor, and a, a baritone. And um, they're, they're part of the life of the church because mm-hmm. they're always here. They're here on Wednesdays, and they sing two masses on Sundays, um, even song twice a month, mm-hmm. and, um, and then lots of other additional feast days. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I, I'm very, very thankful to have them, and we couldn't w- do what we do without them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, think they, I think they really love singing here too, which, which is encouraging for me. Um, that for them, I think musically and spiritually, there's a benefit, mm-hmm. and um, I'm glad to be able to support musicians in our community. Um, I know coming out of COVID, musicians had a really hard time, particularly I think of my friends that are in the symphony. Yeah, um, I can think of several that had to get other jobs, like working at Costco, because they they weren't performing with the with the symphony. Yeah, and um, so I think sometimes musicians are. Um, I don't know. They're thought of. They're taken for granted a lot of the time. They they can be certainly. Yeah. Um, but but these these staff singers they they have they've studied they've spent many many years in school mm-hmm. to protect pro, perfect their craft and um, so I'm very thankful to have them um, and their support. One of the last things I want to talk about, and I'll give some personal background, um, is the ordinary people singing. Um, we've got the paid singers, then we have people in the pew. I, you know, did not grow up singing, um, and, and I'd love for you to speak to this. You know, I grew up, um, did choir, I think, one year, couldn't match a pitch. I got told I couldn't match a pitch, and I didn't really touch it again. Mm. Um, never learned a musical instrument. I'm looking toward my diaconal ordination, and, um, you know, I'm thinking, I better learn how to chant. I'm maybe chanting the gospel <laughs> soon. And I remember the first time, you know, we very first time we did it, you would give me a pitch, and I would be miles away from it. I mean, miles away. And um, I'd never been taught how to make any progress. Um, it was kind of like a, you either can match pitch or you can't. Right. Um, and I was always jealous of people who I thought, I wish I had been born with that ability, um, kind of an innate ability. And, you know, if you show up on a Sunday and, and I'm the one celebrating or chanting the gospel, um, it's not perfect yet. But I'm, I, I'm telling you, it's come a long way from that first week. <laughs> You're doing great. It has come a long, long way. But that's because, you know, you worked with me. You actually taught me using your voice as a muscle. 
it takes practice. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to use your voice. You have to, you know, learn how to match a pitch. You don't just do it. You right. actually have to learn what it feels like. Um, you do it enough until you start getting that muscle memory, and and it and it does make progress. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm I'm I am living proof of this. <laughs> um, come a long way. Still, am excited to go a long way in the future. Um, and then you know that that's that's me. That's chanting. But then I also know people show up to church and that hymnal stays in their pew. Right. They they will not open it. And let's be blunt, a lot of them are men. Right. Um, they just don't sing. You look out in the you look out in the crowd. Um, we're processing in and out. I I see some of y'all. Right. That that hymnal does not get touched. Maybe speak to both of those things. One, I think there's a there's a bad intellectual habit of you either can sing or you can't. Um, I, you know, had that for a long time, that, that mm-hmm. idea. Um, speak a little bit about, you know, why, why is it possible? And, and honestly, why does it work that you have to learn how to sing? I mean, what, what is that? Speak a little bit about that. And then secondly, why should people sing? What, what is the benefit of that, of showing up, getting there a couple minutes early, marking the hymns, mm-hmm. um, participating in the musical aspect? I mean, we ask them to participate in the prayers. They say the confession together. When it comes to singing together, singing our praises, all of a sudden, some people, that's a step too far. Maybe speak about both of those things, because I think they tie in a little bit together. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard way too many stories about people that were told by a music teacher when they were young that they don't sing well, nope. and then they suddenly stopped, and uh, that makes me sad. Um I, I could say a lot about that. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, um, so I came to Winston-Salem to study with Barbara Lister Sink, uh, study piano, and um, she's really probably the best piano professor I've ever had because she really took the mystery away from playing the piano. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't see piano as um, this gift that only a few people possess, um, but as as something that anyone can learn. And she has gone to great pains to create a very methodical approach to, to learning to play the piano. Then you can really follow it step by step. And um, maybe you're not going to be Van Clyburn, mm-hmm. but you can definitely improve a great, great deal by following these steps and um, sort of taking away the mystery behind playing the piano. And I think the very same thing is true for voice. Um, Unless you have like a, a vocal impairment or a right. hearing p- impairment, otherwise you certainly can sing. If you are talking, you can sing. Um, the same thing is is that that lets your voice be heard when you're speaking mm-hmm. is the same thing that will and let it l- you, allow you to sing. Yeah. <laughs> and you already naturally, you know, you get excited, you go a little higher. Certainly, you talk yeah. quietly, you go a little lower. You know how to do that. Um, it's just learning how to do it to a tune. Right, and I think. Part of it is probably ego. Um, mm-hmm. If we can learn to sort of put our ego on the shelf and just try something new, be willing to be bad at something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to be willing to be bad at something to ever improve. Um, so I, th- I think uh, I, I think we have a pretty good congreg- congregation that that likes to sing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there are many times when I'm so encouraged when I'm. Uh, playing a verse that's softer on the organ, and I can hear the congregation singing yeah. downstairs. It's it's thrilling for me. Um, I do I do realize everyone doesn't enjoy singing, which is is just fine. Um, some people like to listen, but I do encourage people to open their hymnals yeah. at the very least. I think devotionally, all of the hymns that that we choose for any particular Sunday definitely serve to amplify the readings Mm -hmm. or the theme for the day. Um, There's lovely, lovely poetry that you'll encounter. I'm thinking about George Herbert and The Call. Yeah. um, That that apart from the music, just the text is really, really meaningful and um, historic and I I think would be edifying in many, many ways. Um, You could literally use the hymnal as your devotional in the morning, yep. if you just open up to your favorite hymnal, hymn and read it as a poem. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're prayers. Yeah, they're prayers, yeah. absolutely. Um, 
And there's a lot of information in the hymnal too, if you wanted to to see, well, who wrote that text, mm-hmm. and then and do a little bit of research. There are many, many ancient texts that we mm-hmm. have. Um, they're usually translated. Yeah. Um, but there, if if you're if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go down all kinds of wormholes in in discovering um, who wrote this text and what what was the original purpose. Um, I think it's fascinating. I um. I love the 1982 hymnal, and I did not grow up with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I can say it's my favorite hymnal that I've encountered thus far in, in my life, and I just think it musically and um, spiritually, it's been a great source of inspiration for me. So I definitely encourage everyone. Um, we're not choosing these hymns willy nilly, so mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, if you don't like to sing, open the hymnal and follow along. Yeah. I, I think that could be really um, inspiring for you. I hope so. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a there's an intentionality there. Right. There's, you know, you're missing an opportunity to be formed and to and to pray. There's a wonderful quote. I don't remember who said it, but you know, Kristen and I used to say it is he who pray or he who sings prays twice. Right. Because yeah. it requires a deeper engagement with the words than if you're just reading them on a text. You're I mean, I know when I when I chant a gospel, I am far more engaged with that than mm-hmm. if I read it, um, because I'm I'm thinking about the words, I'm thinking about the flow of the sentences. Um, there is a deeper engagement there, and so you really do miss a great deal if you're saying I'm I'm not going to sing. And again, you know, it, you have to be willing to be bad at something to get better. Um, it, I had to get over that hump. Mm-hmm. It's not gonna be it's not gonna be good. <laughs> it might be okay. But it, you've got to you've got to pass those stages. You know you've got to do it poorly to do it a little better, to do it okay, to to start to get good at it. Right. Um, I, uh, your your point too, though. Like ordinarily, singing is slower than speech. Mm-hmm. Certainly, with a Gilbert and Sullivan patter song, that's not the case. But in general, it's slower than yeah. than speech, um, and it does give you more time to think about the text. And I think there there have been many many settings of of great poetry, not even not necessarily sacred, that I've come to adore. I think mm-hmm. about Robert Frost and the the poems from Frostiana, um, that, that I've fallen in love with these poems because I sang them, yeah. and I had time to to really sit with the text and not be in a hurry and and think about it. Um, so the the same is true with the hymnal for sure. Um, George Herbert, Love Bad Me Welcome. Um, I would recommend that to anyone. Vaughn Williams has the most lovely setting of that text, and it's um, one of the most beautiful poems for me devotionally that I, it's, it's probably my favorite poem. Um, I remember uh, the very first gospel I did. I practiced it so mm. much that I still know it word for word. <laughs> and my wife, Chloe, still knows it word for oh, word. Wow. And she will Excellent. occasionally start singing it and, and chanting it because it got stuck in my head. I mm-hmm. did it so, so much. Um, right. The Easter preface was the mm. first preface I did. I know it now. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and the funny part is Father Steve has it memorized too because um, it was one of the first ones he did. And he's done it so much that... They do stick in your head. They do. An earworm can be very encouraging. <laughs> yes. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a cliche um, and ask an organist what their favorite hymn is um, to close out our time. And I'm sure that you know you can you can nuance it by saying, "Well, I have a ton of favorite ones." Sure, Maybe yeah. recently, what's been one of your one of your most favorite ones? So um, the the first one that comes to mind. Um, the, the tune, the Passion Chorale, we often sing the text, Old Sacred Head Now Wounded. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's another text we have in here, Commit Thou All That Grieves Thee. Um, that text just speaks to me every time that, that we use it in, in worship. And um, I'll look it up right here just to see if, if anyone is listening and has a hymnal there. Um, it is hymn 669. And... Um, We'll sing it a few times a year, um, but I just find this text particularly to be very inspiring. The, the last verse, hope on, then broken spirit, hope on, be not afraid, fear not the griefs that plague thee, and keep thy heart dismayed. Mm. Thy God in his great mercy will save thee, hold thee fast, and in his own time grant thee the sun of joy at last. 
And um, I just am always uh, inspired whenever that shows up in, in worship. And um, I, I try to play that in such a way that uh, I, don't, I don't know if it comes through, but um, when, when I very often will have a text that really speaks to me and uh, it sort of inspires the way that I register the organ, hmm. um, you know, for a more poignant verse or for a, a verse that I think is a point that really needs to be driven home. Um, I'll register the organ in a way I think that reflects that text. And um, this one I always feel really passionately about that I want to make sure this message is, is, is getting out there uh, and the organ that is supporting it really well. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I course, know people have you know, asked to, to have you on, and people are excited, and they love our music department. And I think this you know, gives people a, a, a small glimpse into your world, um, into everything that goes into our, our music at St. Timothy's. Um, we do it well, and that is because of you and intentionality and, and the work of the choral scholars and our other singers and all of that work that goes into making Sundays and evening masses and even song. Um, so well done. So, you know, we, if you're, we, I should say we do have very many uh, very committed volunteers yeah. um, that that come to choir practice after they've worked an entire day. Yep. And um, and they sing on Sunday mornings, which makes Sunday mornings a little more complicated. Yeah. You know, um, it's a work day for us. It's not for everyone else. Right. Always. Yeah. So I think for the for the choir, um, I think. Most of them, they've been doing it for long enough that they they can worship while they're working. Mm -hmm. um, but it 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 takes it takes time, a lot of people, and um, a lot of time yeah. to to make everything happen. So it's uh, but it, it's a joy, and um, we have rehearsal tonight. So. Yeah, <laughs> and you've got stuff to get ready for, right? Well, if you're listening, I mean, my my last encouragement is. Um, Come to something you haven't before. You've come on Sunday morning, come to the evening mass. We have Ascension coming up right. um, Thursday the 18th. We have Evensong every other Sunday. Um, come to an Evensong. It's, it's wonderfully different than a Sunday morning, and it's done exceptionally well as well. So find a way to um, engage the music that we have here, maybe in a way that you haven't yet before. But thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting sure. down with us, Not with pleasure. me. Um, wonderful conversation and um, again we are thankful to to have you and the work that you do thank you very much let us close in prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.